thanks for joining us this afternoon. It is a real treat to have Lise Wheel, I hope I got the pronunciation correct, uh, here sure with did, us. Patrick. And I'm just going to give a, a brief intro. Um, Lise Wheel is the former legal analyst for Fox News and the O'Reilly Factor and has appeared regularly on Your World with Neil Cavuto, Lou Dobbs, Lou Dobbs Tonight, and the Imus Morning Shows. Uh, the former co-host of WOR Radio's WOR Tonight with Joe Concha and, and Lise Wheel, she has served as legal analyst uh, and reporter for NBC News and NPR's All Things Considered as a federal prosecutor in the United States Attorney's Office and was a tenured professor of law at the University of Washington. Uh, underachiever, Lise. Uh, <laughs> she appears frequently on CNN as a legal analyst. And um, it's really great to have you. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to do this with us. Are you kidding? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on the day that the book comes out. Thank you, yeah. Patrick. And thank you, Poison Pen, you... so much. I'm so happy to be here. Well, and congratulations. Uh, here's the new book, Hunting the Unabomber. Yay. Um, and I guess, you know, it's just kind of a, as a general opener, um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you got interested in this particular case? I mean, there's been, there's been quite a bit about it just recently in, in the news, but it's, it was really, you know, such a landmark uh, precedent-setting case in a lot of ways, you know, affected all sorts of procedural aspects, and we'll get into that a little bit. But uh, why did you why did you choose to write this particular book? It, it really it really has. I mean, it, this guy, the Unabomber, as we knew him, I mean, captured the nation's attention for more than two decades. I mean, and when I say captured the na nation's attention, really in fear. I mean, many of him of us just knew him as the 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 man in the hoodie. You remember that iconic photograph with the mustache and the man in the hoodie. And if we knew anything about him as a Unabomber, we maybe knew about the manifesto, and we maybe knew about him getting captured in that lone cabin in Montana. And that's maybe if you ask somebody in their 20s, and I have kids in their 20s, so I asked them, that's what they knew. Uh, but you're right, there's been a lot written, and so, um, it would be a monumental task to take this on and do anything different. But there was a, uh, a, a series done by Discovery a couple of years ago. I'm going now back several years because this took several years in the writing and research that um, really was done incorrectly. And sometimes those, those series are done incorrectly because they're trying to kind of make things bigger and more sexy, really, for television and wrap things up in a neat, in a neat bow, which they, some, this case in particular could not be. And it was, a, was, it was a docudrama, really. Docudrama, more, exactly. And sometimes is, we take them as to be reality. But, yep. but I did kind of my own little mini hunt, and I found an FBI agent who had long since been retired um, for a couple of decades, actually, and was living a, just a, a you know, perfectly wonderful, quiet life um, in New Hampshire, of all places, with his wife, Florence. And he had been the special agent in charge of the task force, the Unabomber task force in San Francisco. Why is San Francisco so important? Well, San Francisco, of course, is where a lot of the bombings had taken place. Now, of course, the Unabomber, you know, had bombs exploding all over the country, um, you know, this de two decades long. Um, you know, multiple bombs, but a lot of them took place in Berkeley, California, that place. So the task force, the Unibomb task force, as it was called, was led in, by major part by this one agent, Patrick Webb. I've got to give you a little bit of my own background, aside from that very kind background that you just read. Please. I'm also a third generation federal prosecutor. My father was one before me and also my grandfather. And I'm the daughter of an FBI agent. Well, using that federal family key, as I call it, because once you're in the federal family, FBI agents um, and former FBI agents kind of are more willing to talk to you. Because uh, obviously I worked with FBI agents when I was a federal prosecutor. My dad is an FBI agent. I got to Patrick Webb. And Patrick Webb told me, he said, Lise, that docudrama really is upsetting to me because 
they misconstrued so many things that are crucial to the way the hunt for the Unabomber really happened. I mean, big things. Like they said that there was one guy who pretty much cracked the entire case and basically became, I'm not gonna say friends with the Unabomber, but met with him several times. Well, this guy, yeah, he was on the task force and I talk about him in the book and he, he you know, he's part of the task force and he did do things, but he never even met with the Unabomber. I mean, these are crucial things that are important to people's understanding of the case. And this is, as you said, an historically important case. It has social relevance even today. Even today, people understand Unabomber. It's a moniker for, for certain cases. When there's a bombing that happens now, oh, that's like the Unabomber. I mean, it has a social relevance even today. So he said, I want to help you set the record straight. And I said, well, Patrick, if we're going to do that, this is a monumental task. I need you to open up all your old files, all your 302s. That's what the FBI writes, you know, all the reports, all your data, everything. And I need you to do more than that. I need you to get me to primary sources, other people who are going to document what you said, who were there at that time. And I need through that, you know, walk me through what happened. And this was really a big ask for anyone and especially for Patrick, who was very sadly um, dying of, of cancer at the time. So he amazingly graciously said, this is important enough to get this right for history. I will help you do this. And we did it. Wow. This is the product. Um, you know, I, I was mentioning before about, you know, some a lot of the precedents that this case really set. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, for one thing, can we go kind of go back in time and, and just establish sort of the details of when the first bombing was, uh, which was it late 70s, is that correct? Oh, right. 78, 79, something like that. And then, so he was, he was on the loose, as it were, and committing these, these, uh, these crimes until 1996. Right, 1996 is when they pulled him out of the cabin. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, 20 years. Yeah, 18 years, and uh, it's funny because uh, just watched a recent, a, a recent a series about the Ted Bundy case. You know, mm -hmm. and um, the only reason I bring that up is is because when investigators were looking at all these crimes that, which occurred all over the United States. Um, it was a very, you know, obviously a different time, and the com yes. communication was not up. You know, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have all these resources, um, and so even that short time, relatively short time ago, you know, thirty years ago, thirty, you know, it was much easier for somebody to slip across state lines and disappear, and that world has really changed now. Um, yeah, Th that's right. That's right. I mean. You have to, exactly, and, and I try to go, you know, through Patrick's eyes and the eyes of the other agents that I interviewed, you know, for this for the book, I take you through that hunt and and bring you back in time. I mean, it, it's almost unbelievable now to think that, you know, agents' reports had to be typed up back in Quantico, for example. I mean, typed up, you know, faxed and that state and local agents were communicating with FBI. So, because as you said, these, these bombings, first of all, they weren't putting together as Unibomb. They would happen one place, you know, at a, at, at, a, at a university, for example, and then happen at another place that had nothing to do with the university. So for a long time, they weren't even put together as Unibomb. And one of the big things that Patrick Webb and the other agents had to come to terms with in the beginning years was sussing out even that this was a serial bomber and that that was one person or entity. When he started writing, the Unabomber started writing, he called himself FC right. and they. So the agents didn't know that it was one person. You know, we're was, jumping ahead to 96 when they pull him out of this long cabin. But for many, many years, they didn't know that it was one person. Yeah. They, they didn't think they thought it could be an organization. 
there were so many different leads that, you know, hundreds at, at one point of agents had to follow. And I go into this book really into the investiga investigative part of this. I guess that becomes from my background. Sure. Again, as the daughter of an FBI agent and, and a federal prosecutor, because I'm so interested in that, is to the nitty gritty of the false leads and the honestly the anger and the resentment and the frustration that those agents felt and also you as you pointed out kind of the blunders because of the miscommunication now some of that can be let brought to the feet of well you know it was that time and miscommunications happen and and it, you know they didn't have the 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 skills that we have now or the data the right. computers but you know what some of it happens even now i'm telling you because of egos in these different agencies sure. i'm sorry it's true right you really get a sense of of the of the frustration you know as they're trying to um you know as they're investigating the case and trying to come up with a motive they don't they really yes. don't even have a motive they're yes. you know it's they seem they to know. be and just just to kind of for the record um the basics this was news to me. I, I wasn't sure what Unabomber meant and what that acronym really st stood for, which was, I'm going to get it wrong, um, University and Airline Bomber, right? right? Essentially, that was, right. the, that was the acronym for the... Right. Okay. Right, because he, he did, in all of this, I mentioned the universities, he targeted it, except for Harvard, which is where he went, because he didn't want to target, the thought thinking later was, he didn't want to target Harvard. We'll get into that. that. Could, like he, yeah, but like Harvard broke him for some reason, and he yeah. wouldn't want to target his alma mater. I mean, look, the guy is, you know, a wackadoodle. I mean, and that's that's a, that's a psychological term that you know I'm a, I've got a doctorate in psychology. <laughs> but, but a brilliant wackadoodle. <laughs> but, but but anyway, he didn't want to target Harvard. But anyway, targeted university, and then yeah, he targeted an airplane. Um, fortunately, nobody was killed in that one. Um, it was, it, it didn't go off properly. You know, it, it was good, you know, oh, poor Unabomber didn't go off properly, but it, thank God it didn't. But yeah, so it was Una and, and then, and, and then, then, then it tar he targeted the um, an airline. So that's how they got the moniker. Um, but again, so you can see the disparate leads that they were, they, they were trying to follow. Um, it took, it, it didn't make sense and there wasn't a motive. I prosecuted a lot of cases. And the first thing I'm gonna tell you, a prosecutor looks for motive. I mean, the usual ones, money, greed, revenge, I hate this person, sex. You know, there's, there's usually, if you find the motive, you can usually track it, you know, you, you follow that lead. Right. That is what, you don't have to prove motive when you go to court. Not that many people know that. Um, you don't have to prove that when you go to court. But as a prosecutor, motive is your best thing to hang on to when you're looking for leads to catch the crook. But here, we couldn't find motive. And because the Unabomber made these bombs in this little place in Montana from just rubbish off the street, basically, not high fangled you know, things, it was impossible to trace them back to you know, uh, uh, aluminum aluminum plant you know plants or uh, any kind of any kind of plant where they would have been you know manufactured you know the parts of the bombs because that's the other thing that, that investigators usually look at where was the bomb manufactured taking apart apart the parts this was they were manufactured from trash rubbish well uh, it was also interesting to read that. Um... He would. He was very, very careful about that. You know, stripping the metal casings off the batteries, wiping, yeah. wiping some of that. You know, the evidence away. Um, yeah. And just, just let's just talk about uh, about Ted Kaczynski himself. Um, did you have uh, an impression of him sort of going into the into the into the research? You know, you know. I mean, like everybody else, I'm sure you were well aware of the case, and but. Um, what did you learn about him throughout the course of writing the book, and uh, did your opinion of him change? I read somewhere that you, you, did, you weren't really that sympathetic to him. Did that change at all? I, all right, that's a very good question because it, it takes me from 
when I started the book, my mindset then all the way through. And when I started the book, I had the impression of, as you know, we describe um, everyone else had. And I looked at it as, a, he looked at him as a subject of social relevance because this hunting series for me, I pick subjects that have done really bad things, but there are a lot of people who've done really bad things. And I'm not gonna spend two years of my life just picking somebody because they've done really something bad. Lots of people have done things bad, but who have had social relevance because of what they've done. The first book was on Charles Manson. Did really bad stuff, okay? But he's had a social relevance beyond that. Right. Ted Kaczynski, I went into it the same way. Fascinating guy, there's a wonderkin, went to Harvard at age 16, then taught for a while, you know, mathematics genius, and then went completely off the grid and started making doing these bombs, terrorized the country for two decades, wrote this manifesto that still has social relevance today. People mm. still cite these this. There are still people out there that are his followers. So I went into that with, with that, that sort of thought, wow, this guy is interesting. He has social relevance today. Okay, so that was, a, that was Lee sort of a theorist, journalist, that kind of thought. Then I met Patrick Webb, the agent. Such a hatred for Ted Kaczynski. He said, I don't give a, this is a family show. Can't tell you what he said about him. Rat's ass. I, you can guess. I just want you to get the hunt right. What, what the investigation was all about, Lise. What you think about him, I don't really care. Mm -hmm. I'll just wrap it up into that little nice for television sound bite. So I had that. And then I did study, I did a lot of study through obviously Kaczynski's works. He did a lot of writing, he's very prolific, even in prison. Um, there's a lot of work that he's done and it's, it's held in Michigan, in the Michigan library. I mean, again, this research took two years. And so I read about his childhood. His mother still loves him. You know, he went through a Harvard experiment where it really did look awful. They did to this 16 year old kid. I mean, it was brutal. It was, you know, just trying to break him and it looked pretty brutal. And a lot of psychologists have said, you know, that prop that could have changed him. And then there and was, was that, that childhood uh, illness that he had. I was gonna say, it was just, then there was a childhood illness that he had where he was kept apart from his mother. Um, and his, his, brother, his brother David says that he was never really the same after that. Okay. The man went into a lone cabin in Montana and constructed bombs for nearly 20 years mailed them out, took buses to get them where they were supposed to go, wrote horrible things about how he wanted to kill people, wanted to kill more people. I don't have, no, I don't have a lot of sympathy for him. I'm sorry, yeah. I don't. Yeah. And yeah, was hard awful on him? Sure. And did, was, he, was he taken away from his mother and did he have a childhood illness? Yes, but everything I read about his parents is that they were pretty good to him. And his brother is a hero and seems like a sweet guy. And I'll tell you why I know that from personal experience. I wrote his brother a letter asking whether he would speak to me about this book. His brother wrote me the nicest note, declining to speak to me about this book, but the nicest note saying, no, he didn't have to do that. He doesn't know me. He didn't owe me a, a nice written note. And then he, he did his own memoir, didn't he? Exactly, yes. And he said, in that memoir, I really said everything I want to say, but you know, uh, thank you very much. It wasn't like a, it, was, it wasn't even like a, a two sentence note. I mean, it was, I mean, it wasn't a long letter, but it was a, a one page letter. I mean, that's class. Now taking us well, through. I don't have a lot of sympathy. No, I don't. I'm sorry. I don't. I'm not even gonna say I'm sorry. I don't have sympathy for him. Right. Um, well, let's just kind of briefly go through uh, go through the bombings. Not all the details, but he was learning his 
craft, as it were, you know, as you said, using these very, you know, kind of everyday rudimentary objects. Um, and, you know, there was a period where he kind of, you know, the first handful of them were not lethal. He, right. Nobody was killed. A lot of maiming and, you know, you know, injuries and such. But uh, finally he kills somebody. And uh, there's a point where he, you know, the bombs are, are unwieldy enough where he has to actually travel around to these destinations and leave them, you know. Um, he takes a bus. He takes, right. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, and it is kind of amusing reading later. He talks about, yeah, it cost me 300 bucks and it didn't even go off, you know, and some of those. Sort of, I know, that's what I mean. Some of those details are pretty funny. But then there's a big difference then when he kind of gets it down to a mailable package size and then the game really changes. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that? Right, he gets it to a mailable package size and the bomb, when the, that bomb opens, that when, when somebody opens that bomb, I think, yes, that's the first bomb that actually goes off and, well, he's successful. I mean, um, and it's after that, the, the one good thing, if you can call it a good thing, about him using that route of putting it through the mailbox is that the FBI agents then come up with an idea of doing a simulation, right? Of trying to figure out, um, to, of making a bomb that would fit through a mailbox or not. You know, it's different mailboxes of that. This is oh, back and now, now we have to you know, travel back in time to when we actually use mailboxes. Now we, you know, we don't use them. But so they they constructed a, uh, a bomb to fit a particular mailbox, and when it did or did not fit, they figured they were they were getting closer to figuring out where he would have mailed it from, or could have mailed it from, and it was kind of you know a eureka moment, if you will, as to the destination from which he would have been been at least I mean, they were getting closer to finding him right. and through these methods of simulations of exploding the bombs from the package the size this package of the bomb itself and then you know as these things progress you know you mentioned uh webs um you know frustration with uh you know they came very close to if i'm not mistaken uh shutting down the investigation Yes. And, uh, oh my gosh, yeah. that was one thing that, that I don't think anybody, well, I know nobody's reported on uh, because only, you know, Webb hasn't talked about it. And that was shocking to me. Here you have this Unabomber investigation, the biggest case really in the country, you know, full stop. And at one point, the, the bombings had, there was a lull in the bombings. The leads were going nowhere, and headquarters, Washington, D.C., was coming in to tell San Francisco where you know, the task force was, shut it down. It's getting embarrassing for us that we haven't found him, so we're just pretty much going to assume that he's either dead or he's been incarcerated on some other crime and, you know, that's it. He's, we, we're just going to shut it down. And because morale had sunk to an all time low, the leads were going nowhere and, you know, let's let it go. And Patrick Webb, along with another uh, agent, they just couldn't stomach that. You know, they said, what are, what are we going to, and, and throw it back to the locals through all the bombings that, that were unsolved, because of course they were unsolved, back to the locals, and which of course would have much fewer resources. In other words, pretty much say they're never gonna be solved. You know, what am I gonna tell that the mother of the, of the man that's been hurt or maimed or even killed? What, what am I gonna say? What am I gonna do? And, and Patrick knew in his gut, his bones, whatever, that this was not the end of the Unabomber, that the Unabomber was still out there. 
and whoever he it, they she was and wherever they were were far from being done but were only perfecting their craft and that was absolutely what was happening and they gave him like would, a year's extension on the yeah 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 and within well and i don't want to say thankfully but within that year of course the unabomber sprung up and thank goodness i mean you know if, if it hadn't been for for webb who's this you know i keep bringing up his name as a, as, a, as his hero but he's really this soft-spoken you know guy who just had reti he retired never to talk about it again um I keep kind thinking, of guy I keep, I keep thinking you know, exactly. my dad you know he's not he's not like a big like i need you know the you know credit for this but all of this came out in the course of you know my talking to him for, for many you know, all of this time right. but he said yeah it almost got shut down we almost shut that it almost shut that sucker down well yeah and then let's talk a little bit about you know you said he does re-emerge and he re-emerges re in a big way and he starts to engage the public and that's when things really get very different um you know he writes was it the new york times he wrote directly to the new york times and started this almost like in some ways the zodiac you know killer in this in a similar way and you have to wonder, was his ego such that it was building, it was building, and he just couldn't, you know, he couldn't stay silent. Um, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Again, they gave me my psychology with my JD, so I don't know. I, or I gave another $6 to, to Harvard and they gave me my psychology degree. I, I don't know whether it was his ego. But it certainly seems to me that that's what was going on because... Again, here he was, he was in this remote cabin in Mont Lincoln, outside of Lincoln, Montana, and they hadn't caught him. Uh, he was getting better at his craft, right? He was being more, quote unquote, successful. And he was sending little notes and, you know, there were little clues, which I talk about, with the little things that would go along with the, with the bombs, little cute little things. But the, the FBI, you know, was, was, it was tracking down all these leads and they were getting closer with some things, but they hadn't caught him yet. That's the bottom line. Um, and so, yeah, the, 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 the note to the, the, the times was basically a hostage note, let's face it. And it was, I have this manifesto uh, that I want you to publish and if you publish it, I promise I won't kill anybody. I may do a little bit of, you know, sabotage, but I won't kill anybody. That was pretty much the, the kidnapping note. Right. And so that left, the, of course, the New York Times went straight to the FBI with this. And the, I catalog in the book exactly what happened through Webb because he was involved with this and went, of course, this went to FBI headquarters, at New York Times, Washington Post was brought in too. What would they do? I mean, now you've got a clash. Journalists at New York Times, you're not gonna negotiate with a terrorist. I mean, this guy's a terrorist. But he's saying, they are saying, FC is saying, if they publish this manifesto, whatever it's going to say, of course, they don't know what it's going to say, he'll stop this. They'll stop this. We could possibly save lives with this. On the other hand, if we publish this thing, we are acquiescing to terrorists. I mean, just like we, the government, don't acquiesce to terrorists. We don't negotiate with terrorists. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the pinnacle of our journalism, we don't acquiesce to terrorists. And so FBI, what do we do? And in the book, there's this, there's this you know, big meeting where the forces get together and talk about it, what to do. And the, uh, we'll talk about the manifesto a little bit, but um, let's talk about this task force, you know? And I, I don't want to give away the entire book, but- um, No, no, no. No, because there's a lot, I mean, this, 
at least for me anyway, the, the suspense of just reading the details and getting into the minutia is really fascinating. It's, a, it's an absorbing read. Um, even though we think we might know how this case went and how it, how it, how it ended, it's a fascinating read, um, which takes us into some unexpected directions. It really uh, does, doesn't it? It, sure it took does. me unexpected directions. So Janet Reno is in office, and um, let's talk about the task force, because that was really, you know, until then, if I'm not mistaken, you know, these collective uh, databases where, you know, the different agencies could pool their resources and log in, you know, and, uh, you know, trade notes. This was a game changer and really set the stage for, you know, future investigative uh, technique. Right. Well, because back then they were mostly separate. Like you had Postal and Postal did what Postal did. At FBI, you had DEA, you had ATF, you had all these agencies that did their separate things. And Janet Reno said, you know, you guys need to pool everything. You need to work together as one. Now, again, egos get involved, personalities get involved, government agencies, you know, grind slowly. Mm. <laughs> and, but this had to be done quickly and it had to be done without ego and it had to be done, you know, um, in, a, in a way that could blend a lot of paper, a lot of database, uh, a lot of names being brought together, a lot of tips from the public because for, uh, this was another thing that was a big game changer is that the FBI um, along with Postal had to agree um, that they would ask the public for help. Again, that's hard for the FBI just as a part of their culture to ask the public for help and they had to set up tip hotlines and people to staff those hotlines and which tips to follow. All of that had to be coordinated and it had to be coordinated by through interagency. And even that, setting all that up back in the day was a big deal. Now it's not, we don't think about that, but this case was really precedent setting for that. Once that was done with via Unabomber, it became a lot more easier for other cases to follow through with it. So, you know, I guess, you know, thanks to the Unabomber, that made it easier for other cases in the future. Right. Now, just a little bit, a little bit more about Kaczynski himself. I mean, we mentioned okay. that he was, uh, you know, he was, by all accounts, a brilliant mathematician. Um, uh, you know, as you say, he was, he went to Harvard at 16. Um, was involved with this, I think Murray was the name of the site. Somebody, Murray, is that right? Something like that. He was the Professor, one that yeah. conducted, oh. conducted this very controversial um, testing thing, basically where he, the goal was to destroy, to see how much the student could take or the subject could take uh, emotionally, destroying them, um, what they could handle. Uh, from what I could gather, that was sort of the goal to see how far he could take it. Um, and, uh, you know, as you say, Kaczynski never seemed to target Harvard. Um, and that was interesting. Right. Um, now, when we get to the manifesto, you know, a lot of us, you know, obviously read that in real time with, as, as a curiosity. What, it, what is it about this? And, you know, in, you know, you read it now and you think, okay, well, I guess my question to you is there is, there is a faction of people who, you know, anarchist groups and, you know, people like that who look at it and say, well, you know, the, he is, there is sense in here, you know, where he's talking about the perils of, you know, technology and things like that. Um, why do you think, uh, wh what's your take on that? Do you think that there is, amidst all of the, um, I don't know, I don't really have a question. I'm just talking kind of well, I know, I know what you're, I know about what you're the manifesto. Say. Because I went into it with the same thinking that, yeah. you know, there, he, he rails against society. Uh, he rails against, no, he rails against technology right. as the ultimate killer, really, of society and, right. and science, really, that, that studies technology mm. as a part of that. So the technology, 
uh, we would even call it, um, you know, AI now, you know, is just the, the, the killer of, of creativity and it's ultimately what is going to bring down society. So computerization, I mean, back then, there were, you know, emails were just starting, but any kind of computerization, um, you know, iPhones would be, oh my gosh, you know, I can't right. even imagine this be coming out now. But, you know, anything like that, but again, you have to remember this was decades ago, but the, the genesis of all of this, you know, all of that, the science, the study of it, any kind of computerization, um, which is kind of odd for a mathematician because you would think that the next thing, you know, the, the jumping step would be, you know, science and technology and study of technology and AI. But no, he's just said, you know, all of that um, is horrible and it's going to ultimately bring down society. So it, the, the broad scope of it is that it is a manifesto against the technology, you know, technology is going to bring down society. Now, if you read it carefully, it, it also rails, but you know, it's very, it can be, it can be sexist, it can be racist. If you read, you know, line by line through the manifesto, there's a lot of other bad stuff in there. Um, I think what you're talking about is, is what we sense today, a lot of us, hey, you go to dinner, not anymore, let's talk about pre-pandemic, we would go to dinner and we would be at a nice dinner and we'd look around, everybody's on their cell phone. And you know, hey, that's too much, you know, take your phones off, you know, too much, too much, uh, we're on our phones too much, the kids are on their phone too much, technology's too, too much, technology's killing us. You know, that kind of thing that we sort of say offhand. I think maybe that's the sense that you're getting at, and so but our, we can. Our solution is, isn't to go blow up our eyes. But, but thank you. Our solution is to maybe make a personal change. I'm, I'm not to gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna be on my cell phone as much. Yeah. Is thank you. Is not to say technology at, at all is bad. The science of technology at all is bad. AI is bad. It's to make a personal decision about how we're going to use technology in our lives and we're not gonna let it drive our lives. We're gonna take the good things about technology that brings, thank you Zoom, thank you very much Zoom, uh, for example, or thank you, you know, whatever it is that we have in our lives. Thank you refrigerator. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Thank yeah. you, my icebox works. Right. Um, but, you know, no to other things. I'm not gonna have my cell phone on at night, whatever it is in sure. our lives. Yep. But not to go blow up people to make a message to get your manifesto published in the right. New York Times. Exactly. But there are people today, when I spoke about social relevance at the beginning, there are still people today that, for whatever reason, follow the manifesto or want to follow the manifesto, just as there are people today that think, you know, Charles Manson still has some kind of, you know, draw on that. Yeah. It's yep. interesting from a psychological, sociological point of view to study. Right, right. Um, let's see, do, do you have any questions? <clears throat> we have how, some questions from the audience that we'll ask. Okay, great. Yeah. How does, Love it. How does, the, how does the author feel about, true crime, about the true crime genre being so popular now? Books, streaming services, podcasts, she's been in the field as an author for a long time. What is our fascination? Oh, well, I mean, I have to admit that when I'm on um, my little treadmill or whatever, I'm tuning into, what am I, I'm, you should see my hands, I'm going like treadmill, like they're like going like this, like I'm on the treadmill, um, that I'm tuning into true, a true crime podcast. Oh yeah, just listen to the dating game killer, really good one. That's a good one. Um, I'm on, you know, I listen to Dateline all the time, they're great about great true crime podcast, oh yeah. It, they're just, they're interesting. They tell stories. Look, I, I also write mystery, you know, not, uh, fiction, obviously. Um, some of it's taken from my federal prosecuting days, wink, wink. Um, and so, but they're fiction. Um, we write about what we know, right? Uh, there's their stories. They're interesting. Look, Patrick, we just talked about a really interesting story. I mean, Right? This is a fascinating story. I mean, why did he do this? What was the motive? What, you know, I'm still trying to figure it out. 
the, the hunt is fascinating to me. I could go on and on and on about these twists and turns and how these and how the, the FBI agents reacted to this yeah. and how his mom reacted. I mean, there's just, we like stories and true crime gives us stories. And it, do you, don't you think it taps into something primal in us? You know, these primal fears that we all have, um, especially in this case, you know, the unknown, you know, where's he gonna strike next? Uh, well, in this case, we know he's locked up. True. So that's- That's true, <laughs> that's true. We don't have to worry, he's right. locked up. Right, right. We do know that, you know, he is behind bars, so we don't have to worry. I will give that part of the way of the book away. He is locked up. So we like. To, I think we like to be scared too. You know, and there's probably an aspect of you know, liking the, the yeah. resolution. Yeah. Yeah, and what's and resolution? I mean, of course, like same in my mysteries. I mean, there's always there's a, there is a fear factor. We don't know. We also like to solve things. I mean, right. I was reading. I'm really gonna date myself here. But I, I'm the quintessential little kid that was reading Nancy Drew and Encyclopedia Brown and the Hardy Boys and all of that when I was a little kid and trying to figure it out. I really was trying, to, okay, where are the clues? And then if I didn't figure it out, I was like, oh, I missed that. You know, so and, and in my mysteries, I write them so that you're not, I mean, you maybe could have, could have figured it out. I mean, I don't write them so like they're so implausible you couldn't have figured it out, maybe. Mm. You know, because I want you to be thinking. Um, I, you know, it's fun. It's fun to. It, yeah. Books should books should at the at the at the at the level right. They should always entertain. I think and also inform. I mean, right? Isn't that what we're trying to do? think so yeah yeah we've got some more questions here um did you reach out to ted can you speak to reaching out uh, to ted of course i reached out to ted kaczynski of course i tried to get him i would have loved to have spoken with him sadly he did not reply to my many many letters and i wrote to him saying you know i grew up in yakima washington it's a fairly remote place you know I know about being, you know, in a remote place. It's not Lincoln. It's not Lincoln, Montana. But I mean, I did try different things. I said, you know, I, I'll give you a fair, try, a fair shot here. You know, I tried. I wrote to different types of letters to try to get him to talk to me. He would not. But his brother David wrote that very nice, kind response. So, you know, two brothers, two different responses, or not a response. But yes, of course, I tried. I feel like I, I, I try to reach Charles Manson too. You know, a good journalist, you try to reach your subject. You try to get all sides of the story. Yeah, I mean, his his brother David was obviously very instrumental in, you know, yes. solving this case. I think maybe we should leave that for the people, oh, the people to. I, I could talk forever about this. I'm so excited about this book, and yeah. and and really just I thank Patrick Webb, you know, so much for for taking so much of his sweet precious time to help me with this. Yeah, let's see what else we might have. Okay, um, let's see. Can we talk a little bit about? Well, I'm tempted to because it's this case is so damn fascinating. Um, <laughs> what time? What time we got here? Now oh, we got well, plenty, we got plenty of time. Um, okay. I want to talk just about a, some of the details. You know, when they bust this case open, and his cabin. You know, it's 10, 10 by twelve, right? Very tiny yeah. little place. Uh, no running water. No electricity. Um, this tiny little loft where he sleeps, I believe, on some stairs. Um, yep. And what they... It's about the size of his prison cell now. Ah, interesting. <laughs> maybe Seriously. He was, maybe he was thinking ahead. Uh, yeah. Getting himself yeah, yeah. acclimated. Um, but what they find in that, in that cabin is pretty damn fascinating on all sorts of different levels. Um, one thing is the typewriter. You know, it, it plays a key role in this whole case. You know, they are able to, you know, analyze the typeface and determine that this is a, was it a Royal? No, I think it was a Smith Corona. Smith from, Corona. Made between 1925 and 1930. They were able to narrow it down. And, uh, you know, it's a very romantic detail in this case, you know, for people following along. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit maybe about just a couple of things that they found and when they when they got to that cabin? Well, they also found a bomb. Yes. That was, I mean, pretty much set and ready to go. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Patrick Webb, my source, was one of the guys that was, he's a bomb technician, right? And he was one of the guys that was in there, um, all suited up and in there, you know, he was one of, the, one of the guys that found the typewriter and found the bomb. Now, let's set the scene a little bit more. Kaczynski at that point, obviously, had been pulled out of the cabin and was waiting down, waiting, I say it so gently, is waiting. <laughs> was waiting down at another place with other agents. But they didn't know, the agents didn't know what to charge him with yet because they didn't have the typewriter. They didn't have the bomb. They didn't know for sure that Kaczynski was their guy. So what, what Webb and the other guy, the two guys in there found in that search it's not just romantic and you know in a romantic way it was key for charging him at that moment as he's sitting there cool in his jets uh talking to no one by the way um you know with the fbi they find, I mean, his, they find his journals right. his journals and all that too right journals as he's writing all this stuff writing about what he's doing and they found basically, you know, food and things. Um, it was really kind of a, a gunky place to be. It was very smoky. Patrick described it as very smoky because, he, you know, he, he would go outside to urinate and all that, but did everything else inside. He would cook inside. And uh, so Patrick described it as being very smoky and it's kind of smelly. He slept in there. Um, but there was, yeah, there was, there was food. There was, there was a lot of journaling. And the typewriter when they found the typewriter and the bomb that was it they knew they had enough to charge him and and it was just kind of this like the the two agents just looked at each other and said do you know what the current kind of the current disposition of some of that evidence is i mean is the typewriter somewhere that you can go look at it or if you were more yes I, I do um it's kind of a, a good and bad story it was, they all were, and they actually took the cabin, physical cabin, and brought it down to a museum called Museum, Museum in Washington, D.C., say that right, Lise, um, and put it there, and it had a beautiful display, the typewriter, the cabin that they just picked up and must have floated it down in a big plane, and we can put everything in there. Uh, I got a videographer to that museum last December and took a whole video of it, which you can see on my Facebook page, Lease Wheel Facebook or LeaseWheelBooks.com, just my name, LeaseWheelBooks.com. A beautiful video of it, a, a videographer took a whole day down there. Um, and go take a look at that because Newse museum closed several days after that. So we hurried, uh, my wonderful publisher, uh, Thomas Nelson, uh, and I hurried to get that videographer there to take that video because now you can't see it. Now it's closed to the public. I thought you were gonna so, say, I thought you were gonna say a, some heavy metal musician bought it or something. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. I don't know where it is now, but I know it's closed to the public. So we got in there and got one of our favorite um, videographers there. So I, there's actually a video where I, my voice is, you know, chatting over it, but I, I take you through, I show you the cabin and the videographer, you know, shows you what's inside the cabin and everything, including the typewriter. And just one more little detail that was really fascinating yeah. is that, uh, I think they found a, they found a pair of shoes. That oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. The shoes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Good point. Yeah. 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 Well, the shoes that he wore. Oh yeah. The shoes that he wore when he was on this property. <laughs> This is a strange guy that he made that were not his size. So it would look like it was somebody else walking around the property when he would be out there planting, like he was, was planting um, strings, like to catch the snowmobilers when they were right, going, right. or like just catch them and, you know, basically hurt, you know, hurt the snowmobilers as they were going on. But he didn't want anybody to see that it was 
his footprints around the string when it was found? I mean, yeah, so, so she he, didn't match his footprints. He glued on it. He glued on a second, much smaller yeah, sole yeah, exactly. on the bottom of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, just crazy stuff. I mean, pretty smart guy. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's like, and I always say this about criminals in general that are smart like this. It's like, why wouldn't you use your ingenuity for good? You know, you could do so much good in the world. Yeah. <laughs> that's me just being naive. I know. Well, I know, you know, we're here in Scottsdale, Arizona, and you are at an undisclosed locale in the Southwest. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually, yeah, you're in my study where I'm working on my next book. Can you talk about that at all? <gasps> Well, it's the third in the hunting series. And as you know, from my talking about how I pick, uh, pick subjects that are done really bad things, obviously, but who are really socially relevant still today. Mm. Um, that is still true with this subject, but I can't tell you who it is because my publisher would be very mad at me. Mm. So I'd have to come over and like poison pen. I'd have to like, poison your teacup or something if you knew and that would not be very nice of me so I would not do that it wouldn't be worth tea either <laughs> is it can you give us a is it something set in the southwest um well all of my books take me you know this one took me to Vermont uh Michigan uh, uh, a lot of San Francisco the west coast so my books take me all over the place so some of it could be in Southern Southwest. Are you are you well involved in it now or on? I'm well involved in it now. Okay, all right. Do you have a tentative release date? Uh, I, I, that's up to the publisher. It might be next spring, next okay. spring or next fall. All right. Well, we're excited to to hear more about that. Very excited. Um, yeah, yeah. Least... I'm just I'm so thrilled that you have me here. Have yeah, Lisa, thanks so much. And thanks for being such a good sport. As I grill you with all these questions. Um, well, this is no grilling. Are you kidding? We're talking about this, this exciting case. And I'm just so thrilled that, that you read the book and you know it so well. And that, you know, you, uh, you entered into the world of, of the Unabomber hunt. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, fascinating. And, um, you know, who knows, maybe when things, uh, things get back to some semblance of, uh, of normality, who knows when that might be, we can have you in here for a nice live uh, event. That would be a lot of I fun. I would love that. Yeah. I would love that. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate all your kindness and having me here today. It just warms my heart. Thank you so much. Best of luck with the book. And uh, we're going to, we'll say goodbye to our, thanks so much for everybody on Facebook watching. Um, Please watch on Facebook. Yes. Yeah. All right.